just wanted to do some videos about some scientific papers that have caught my eye over the years. This one's about something that's been termed the Dunning-Kruger effect, after its authors Justin Kruger and David Dunning. I was prompted to do this video after seeing a comment on a YouTube video called The Truth About the Sodomites. Charming title, isn't it? Oh, a brimming with love. The comment in question here was a reply to somebody else's comment, it wasn't addressed to me. Um, but it just captured such an irony that it took my attention. It goes something like this. Sodomites are the filth of society, as 6,000 years of history has shown. The Bible supports this fact. You are so diluted and brainwashed, you think theories and opinions are fact. So this guy is accusing someone of thinking opinion is fact. But he's just said the Bible supports the fact that sodomites have been the filth of society for 6,000 years. Calling people filth is inherently a subjective value judgment, an opinion. Very clearly not a fact which would be objective and indisputable. How ironic that this zealot demonstrates the exact confusion between opinion and fact that he falsely accuses others of. This also tallies with the bemusing experience some of us have had in that time of coming away from a debate on whatever subject, having taken the time and care to logically counter every argument, only to have your opponent act as if their arguments are still perfectly intact. It's kind of like all their chess pieces are gone, their king is rolling hideously around on its side, and they're still thinking they hold a stronger position. Have you ever experienced anything like this? Odds are, if you ever participate in debate, especially online, you have. And so we come to the Kruger and Dunning paper, entitled Unskilled and Unaware of It. Fantastic title. They start off recounting the story of one MacArthur Wheeler, who was quickly arrested after robbing two Pittsburgh banks without a hint of a disguise. When he saw the surveillance tapes that later convicted him, he was incredulous and said, but I wore the juice. Turned out he believed rubbing lemon juice in your face rendered you invisible to video cameras. Kruger and Dunning were interested in this cavernous gap between somebody's self-assessed competence and their actual competence. So they constructed a series of tests to help give some explanations to this phenomenon. They argued that people who are incompetent suffer two consequences. One, their incompetence leads them to make poor choices. But two, and this is the crux, their incompetence prevents them from realising they're making poor choices. They'll instead tend to put their failure down to other factors, mostly external. And in that way, they remain under the blissful illusion that they're actually doing quite well. Dunning and Kruger suggest that the skills involved in being competent in some area are often the same skills needed to evaluate that competence. An example that springs to my mind is debate. The skills needed to put forward a logical argument are the same ones needed to recognise a logical argument. So the skills for doing and assessing go together. Dunning and Kruger suggest incompetent people lack something called metacognition, which refers to an individual's knowledge about their own cognitive processes. So Dunning and Kruger got a load of volunteers in, as is often the case, they were university undergraduates, and tested them in various areas that require some knowledge, some skill and discrimination. The first area was humour. Dunning and Kruger compiled a set of 30 jokes, rated by various professional comedians on a scale of not so funny to very funny. An example of a not so funny joke was, what is as big as a man but weighs nothing? His shadow. More of a riddle than a joke, isn't it? An example of a really funny one was, if a kid asks where the rain comes from, I think a cute thing to tell him is, God is crying. And if he asks why God is crying, another cute thing to tell him is, probably because of something you did. Well, maybe my metacognition's a bit rusty, but for me, let me put it this way, it's not a belly laugh, is it? Anyway, volunteers were asked to rate the jokes for humour on the same scale as the professional comedians. Then they were asked to rate their ability to determine what was generally considered funny. This is the result. Now, it's clear to see that the most incompetent, the bottom quartile, demonstrate a huge disparity between their perceived ability and actual scores. But the greater the competence, the closer the perceived and actual come together, showing that competent individuals are much more accurate in their self-assessments. Now, humour was a very ambiguous area to study because it's potentially chock full of personal idiosyncrasies, cultural biases. So in their second study, Dunning and Kruger looked at logical reasoning. And in their third study, they looked at grammar. And here are the results for those two studies. They show much the same pattern as the humour study with incompetent folk massively overestimating their abilities. But an interesting phenomenon that was coming through at the top end was that highly competent people were assessing themselves as less able than they really were. Now, 
Kruger and Dunning thought a different process was going on here. It wasn't so much that the highly competent people were incompetent in self-assessment. It was more about highly competent people maybe giving others too much credit, believing others were generally as competent as them. Because if you think that others are as competent as you, you will rate yourself lower on the percentile scale. That will push you down towards the average. To test this idea, Kruger and Dunning designed an ingenious little sub-experiment where the bottom and top quartile volunteers were asked back to mark test results for their peers. They were then invited to revise their own self-assessments. Now, on seeing how other people were scoring, the scores changed to this. The top quartile, now alerted to other people's actual performance and recognising the true competence levels of their peers, revised their scores and now assessed their own performance much more accurately in relation to others. But the bottom, still unable to recognise competence in themselves or others, stayed pretty much the same, scoring hopelessly wide of the mark. Now, it's not all doom and gloom for the people at the bottom. The study went on to show that training in any area, like social reasoning for instance, will not only lead to more accurate self-assessment, but also more accurate assessment of other people's competence. But then it does beg the question, how do you even know if you're at the bottom percentile? Well, I guess some independently graded testing would be one way of going about verifying your competence in whatever areas you were interested in. Getting social feedback may or may not work, depending on who you surround yourself with. You're not only introducing a variable of how competent they are, you're also introducing the variable of how willing they are to be honest. Interesting study, isn't it? Puts forward some intriguing ideas. So the next time you experience someone totally contradicting themselves but looking at you like you're the stupid one, two words, Dunning-Kruger. Okay, it's hyphenated. Does that make it one word? Okay, they're not really words, are they? They're people's names. So next time, remember, two names, Dunning-Kruger. No, it doesn't sound right. Two words. That sounds much more snappy. Remember this phrase?